about love. Praise God. Praise God. And it came forth during our, our time of worship with Megan, you know, just crying out how the love for her father and her friend. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Am I on? Am I started? Okay. Praise God. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for this day, this day that we get to come here. We get to worship you. We get to love you. We get to. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Lord. That, and I prophesy for our ears to hear the word that you have for today, Lord. I thank you for open, opening our hearts and our, our minds and our ears and our eyes to hear and see the goodness of the Lord, the truth of your word. We surrender ourselves completely and fully to you this day, Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, let's open up. My, the title of my message is On These Two Commandments. On These Two Commandments. Let's open to Matthew 22, starting with verse 34. I'm going to read to 40. Matthew 22:34. And the scribes is the title, which is the first commandment of all. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, "Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law?" Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This was the scripture that I opened to a couple of weeks ago in my daily devotional. That's the scripture that popped right there, front and center. And it stayed on my mind for quite a while after that. I found myself meditating on a section of that scriptural passage that I don't really usually focus on when I read it. And it was verse 40 on the, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I just meditated on that word. And God brought me back to this whole dialogue that I just read to you when I was seeking him about today's message. And when throughout the week I still wasn't quite sure if this was where the message was heading, I got a couple of very strong confirmations as I heard this scripture throughout this week multiple times. Now, I don't know if that's just me and when I'm bringing a message and I have a certain focus, it just, my ears are always perked when I hear that, or, I, or if it's the Lord. Actually, I do know. It's the Lord. That's his way of confirming to me because sometimes I do Kind of question, am I hearing from you, Lord? Is this what you would have for today? So throughout this week, in various places, this scripture came out. Amaze, that amazes me. What a good God we have. He always confirms to me and just brings that peace for me to have. And I just thank him for it, for fathering me so well. Hallelujah. It's interesting to know some of the backdrop of that dialogue that I just read to you in those those words coined or penned in red. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, who did not like each other, it was kind of like the Republicans and the Democrats, they disagreed about a lot of stuff. So they were opposing forces. Both groups set out to entangle Jesus by, uh, as he preached, by asking him some questions that they thought might trap him um, into saying something that would discredit him or, and also become more evidence in their plot that they were plotting to kill him and to stop what he was doing. But Jesus, of course, answered their questions perfect, perfectly, truthfully, and eloquently. So the Sadducees were first. They came first, and he, as it says here, he silenced them with his response to them. He silenced the Sadducees, and the Pharisees were like, oh, you got silenced, ha-ha, so I'm coming. So then they came... And as it says here, one of them, a lawyer, which is someone who studied the law, which is different than our law today, of course, it's the law of Moses, asked him a question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? 
And then Jesus went on to tell them, as we just read. An important part of this story is to note that the Pharisees knew all the commandments by heart and all the laws, which were 613 of them at that time. They knew all of them by heart. They could recite them. They did it daily, every day, twice a day. They would recite all of these commandments. They hung on the doorposts of their homes. They hung in phylacteries that hung from their foreheads. Interesting to me that they hung the word of God from their foreheads, and the Lord put in this scripture, Jesus put in, with all your mind. And Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 6.5 when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and then he adds, with all your mind. With all your mind wasn't in the Deuteronomy scripture, but Jesus added it here. And the law and the prophets, it's interesting. It says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets refers to the entire Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. So that's all the things that they've memorized. He's talking about that. Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So that's another place where we see that, that phrase. In Luke 24, 17, when on the Emmaus road, Jesus taught the two disciples, you know, when he was resurrected from the dead, he taught the two disciples. And it says, everything written about himself in the scriptures, beginning with the law of Moses and the book of the prophets. So all the law and the prophets clearly point to Jesus. And in verse 24 of that Luke passage of scriptures where he taught them on the road to Emmaus and then he later on goes and, and sees them in the house. In verse 44, is Jesus, it says Jesus opened their eyes to the scriptures. He says all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets. And then he included the Psalms in that passage of scripture. But the important part to note is that he was saying all the things you have memorized hanging on those two, hanging on these two commandments. And to many of them, they were only words. They did not put those words into practice. If they did love God with all their being, with all their heart, with all their mind, they would have recognized who he was. They would have recognized Jesus as the Savior. So the books of the law include Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the prophets would include the rest of the Old Testament. So the whole of the Old Testament. And it may seem strange that prophetic books such as Job and Proverbs would be in the prophet category. But the Jews of that time and today would have considered any writer of scripture as a prophet. Now, look at, now let's look at the Mark 12, 32. Same account. Just a few different things in there, but I want to read that as well. Mark 12, 32. Oops, sorry. No, I'm starting a little bit before that. <clears throat> 28, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the word mind there, it says a thinking through, and, and my, combines mind and through. The word suggests understanding, insight, meditation, reflection, perception, the gift of apprehension, the faculty of thought. When this faculty is renewed by the Holy Spirit, the whole mindset changes from fearful negativism of the carnal mind to the vibrant, positive thinking of the quickened spiritual mind. And so down in verse 32 it says, So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. 
is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Hallelujah. That's everything. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now God has strongly been highlighting his love for us. I mean, we heard it this morning in praise and worship. We've been hearing it for weeks in praise and worship. I love you. I love you. I love you. He's telling us he loves us. And but I don't know if it's just me, but does it seem like it's intensifying? That his, his exuberance, his lavishness in that, wanting us to know how much he loves us, is intensifying. It's powerful. It's so strong. And I started to think maybe it was just me because I've been drawing closer to him and my heart is to draw closer to him, but it's not just for me. Hallelujah. It's for us all. It's bigger than me. It's intensifying because his bride is being prepared. We are being ready. It's accelerating fast as the day approaches. And love is the, the main key factor in that. Bride being prepared. Amen. Us, the spotless bride. Hallelujah. And of course, we know the bride is you and me. The body. The bride of Christ. We have to know how loved we are to become that overcoming bride without spot or wrinkle. It's all accomplished by love. I brought a message last year. Oh, how he loves us. And it starts with that. It starts with his love for us. His bride. That's why he calls us that. He loves us. Last year, I just said that I ministered the word, how he, oh, how he loves us. And every week, I love you, I love you, I love you. And it's paramount to the advancing of his kingdom on earth. It all hinges on, on this one all-important word, love. Love. It's a love fest. Yeah. Hallelujah. When we know his love, it's then possible to love him and love others, which he tells us is the, in Matthew 22, 34, and 12, 30, are the greatest two commandments. Love God, love people. Those are the two greatest commandments. Love God first, love people. But we can only do that when we know, when we accept, when we feel, when we live his love for us. I like what John Piper says about verse 40, all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He says, this must mean that if a person understood and obeyed these two commandments, he would understand and fulfill what the whole Old Testament was trying to teach. Everything in the Old Testament, when properly understood, aims basically to transform men and women into people who fervently love God and their neighbor. God is love. It's his nature. God is love. Our whole experience, the whole human experience, meaning, purpose, life, truth, nature, rests on one word, hinges on, is contingent on, or hangs on one word, love. In the greatest book ever written, and it really is the greatest book ever written, I just heard again confirmation that the Bible has been so is the most sold and read book ever. It's the greatest book ever written. God inspired word. So the greatest book ever written contains the greatest story ever told about the greatest person who ever lived who gave us the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Strength. Hallelujah. This word in these scriptures, love, is agape sis or agapeo. An unconditional kind of love. A word that is exclusive only to God and God's love and can only be possible with him. It can't exist without him. God is love. He emanates love. You can't spend time with him and not walk away saturated in it. You can't go in the bathroom and have a bloody nose without being saturated because I just spent time with him and I can't wait to get back. I can't wait to get back. Hallelujah. I believe that this commandment to love God is paramount. It's called the greatest commandment for a very important reason. It's something we need to get. 
in order to fulfill our plan and our purpose on earth and to advance God's kingdom and to live successful, joy-filled, peace-filled, good life and existence. I'm going to look at Deuteronomy. I'm going to start with 11.1. 1. Turn back with me if you would like. Deuteronomy 11. And just a reminder that Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy 6.5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Deuteronomy 11.1. 1. I'm going to kind of go flip through some scriptures through Deuteronomy and read through them. Um, and, so, and you're also invited to do that as well if you're able to. I might go th through them kind of quickly. But Deuteronomy 11.1. 1. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. And I flip over to verse 13. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. I'm going to skip over to 22. Hallelujah. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to, be, to hold fast to him, <coughs> excuse me, to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and you will, be dis you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. And now I'm going to go look at 19.9. 19.9 says, when you come, oops, wrong one, sorry, I was going to 8. And if you keep all these commandments and do them, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk always in his ways, then you shall add three more cities for yourself besides these three. And now I'm going to flip over to 36. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. And I'm going to look at 16, verse 30, 16. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. And then the last one I'm going to read is 20. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days. That you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. Hallelujah. And down in the house it says, the chapter closes with a call to choose the way of life. What's the way of life? We choose it. Love. Love is the way of life. And we have to choose it. We get to choose it, I should say. And to get understanding of why Moses, because Moses is the author of Deuteronomy, is reiterating this command to love the Lord your God with everything within you, let's look at the content and personal application of this book. And I'm going to turn, if you have this same Spirit Build Life Bible, it's in those two sections. I'll get there. It's on page 230. I'm just going to read a little bit of what it says here. So I just read to you uh, just some of, of what Deuteronomy says. It really is all about love. But this is what Moses, Moses <coughs> realizes that the Israelites' greatest temptation in the new land will be to forsake God and to take up the worship of of the Canaanite idols. So Moses was getting older, and he, he knew that a new thing was coming. A new generation is coming forward. So Deuteronomy is his letter to his people, to the Israelites. And so he knew that their greatest temptation would be to forsake God and to take up the worship of the Canaanite idols. Thus he is concerned for the perpetuation of the covenant relationship. He's concerned that they keep that covenant relationship. 
to prepare the nation for life in the new land. God's doing a new thing here and now. And his command to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart is our command today for this new thing that God is doing in our land. Moses expounds the commandments and statutes God has given to his, in his covenant. Obedience to God is equated. Obedience to God is equated with life, blessing, health, and prosperity. Disobedience is equated with death, cursing, disease, and poverty. He loved them. He wanted them to keep this covenant relationship. He wanted them to love God with their whole heart because he knows that's where true life, goodness, blessings, health, prosperity flow from. Deuteronomy is characterized by a strong sense of urgency, even to the contemporary reader. That's you and me. The challenge is decisive. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The decision is ours. Our love, affection, and devotion to the Lord must be the true foundation of all our actions. Wow. Loyalty to God is the essence of true piety and holiness. Success, victory, prosperity, and happiness all depends upon our obedience to the Father. The book, Deuteronomy, is a plea for our obedience to God based upon the motives of love and fear. What does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which we just read about all the law and the prophets, is love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I like how it also kind of tied in, circle back to Jeremy's last message about the fear of the Lord and how important that is. Very interesting. God is talking to us. He has a message for us. He's inviting us to a deeper level. He's inviting <laughs> us to a more, the more that we've been crying out for and asking for. And we all have to answer individually for ourselves. Do I want to go to the next level with God? Or do I want to keep doing my own thing and stay irrelevant ouch if we keep in one place we we stay irrelevant to the move of god what he's doing in this time for such a time as this in this time in history it's time to advance he's called us to be history shakers makers and changers and that's only possible with love and not just any love agape all love the god kind of love so how do we do that? How do we love God with everything within us? I've earnestly asked myself that question. Do I love God? Do I love you like I should? The first step, as I just mentioned, is receiving, embracing, and knowing his love for me. We all need healing in our hearts from wounds in our, in our childhood, our life, rejection, trauma, all kinds of things that can hold us back from fully experiencing the love of God. But it's wholly possible, as many of us already know. He's brought us so far. Right now, I speak healing to all of our hearts. In any areas that are closed off, heal those places, Lord. I speak to all of our hearts and declare that all brokenheartedness be bound up in Jesus' name. And I loose the love of God in each of us right now to fully experience and fill up all those places that need to be filled with his love, his agape all love. I welcome you, Lord, fill me to the overflow. Let's say that together. I welcome you, Lord. I welcome your love, Lord. Fill me to the overflow. Fill me to the overflow with your love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's turn to 1 John 4. Verse 19. It's one line. We love him because he first loved us. Hallelujah. We love him. We can love him because 
He first loved us. Hallelujah. I'm going to go over to the truth in action for that. It's in number two in the truth in action, just a couple of pages over. Under cultivating dynamic devotion, down towards the bottom it says, Ask the Holy Spirit to enable you to know God more, to teach you to pray, to worship, and to love the Lord more deeply. The Spirit comes to reveal Jesus to us. And over next to it, it says, Know that God is in you because he has put his spirit in you. Devote yourself to loving Jesus, recognizing that God's spirit enables you to truly love him. Worship and praise the Lord, thanking him for his great love. Recognize that even your ability to love him is given to you by him. Hallelujah. And we did that this morning, didn't we? We told him how much we love him. Hallelujah. And we can do that. We can agapeo love him because he first agapeo loved us. No greater love than this than a man lay down his own life for his friends Amen. and lay down his life he did. A part of it is reminding ourselves what he has done for us, remembering what he's pulled us out of, remembering where we were and where we are now. We were dying and on our way to hell. But no longer. We owe all our thanks and praise and honor and love to him. He poured out all his love for us. And it's also reminding ourselves about the promises of God. So how do we stir ourselves? How do we cultivate, as it says here, love for God? That kind of love that the greatest commandment tells us to love him with everything within us. How do we cultivate that? I just went through some of it. But it's also reminding ourselves of his promises to us. This book is full of his promises to us. Romans 8.28 And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. 1 Corinthians 2.9 For eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 8, 3. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Oh, to be known by God, the creator of the universe. I'm going to look at Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Ephesians 1, starting with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. And in the helps it says, in an expression of great prose, Paul praises God for all the blessings he has bestowed upon his people. Blessings that are ours because of our relationship to Jesus Christ and that are activated in our lives by the person of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to turn over to Ephesians 3 and read 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the rich riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. I want to be filled with all fullness of God. I'm going to read the truth in action at the end of this chapter, number two. Seek hunger and thirst to know and understand the surpassing greatness of Jesus' love for you. 
In him you are adopted as a child of God. In him you are fully accepted. In him you will find a love that is higher and deeper than you could ever imagine. Through the Spirit you can begin to know this love. And in knowing it, you will be filled with the fullness of God. Devote yourself to knowing, loving, knowing, living, experiencing, and giving Jesus love. Hallelujah. Let's devote ourselves to knowing, living, and experiencing, and giving Jesus our love. Hallelujah. The fullness of God. That's what I want. The fullness. Nothing lacking. No stone unturned. The fullness of God. Amen. That's when we start living victoriously. Delighting in and meditating on the things he's done, the things he's doing, and how deeply he loves us. Dwelling on these things. Spending time in fellowship with him. This is how we cultivate that love for our Father. There's a song, You Are Always On My Mind. It came to my mind when I was doing this message. That's the kind of time he wants. That's the space he wants to inhabit. Always on our mind. Always. He, that's possibility. It's a possibility to always have God on our minds. No matter what we're doing, where we're going, what we're saying, what we're thinking. He can always be on our mind. Hallelujah. And where we struggle with doing that, we ask the Holy Spirit. As it says here, the Spirit that's within us, help. Help me to love you the way you commanded me to. Lord, I want to know you more. I want to love you more. I want to feel your love more. I want to spend more time with you. Help me to do that. Help me, teach me to do that. John Piper says, we best express our love for him when we live not presumptuously as God's benefactors, but humbly and happily as the beneficiaries of his mercy. Love for God is a deep adoration for his moral beauty and his complete fullness and sufficiency. It is delighting in him and a desire to know him and be with him, wanting to please him, we become the source of God's pleasure to the extent that he is the source of ours. That's, that's a good line, isn't it? We become the source of God's pleasure to the extent that he is the source of ours. Let's determine to really make this commitment. It is detrimental for us. The second part, or the second greatest commandment, in the second half of my message, love your neighbor as yourself. Again, I want to emphasize, to put emphasis on it, being the second greatest commandment. In fact, Jesus says it's like the first, meaning it's imperative for us to live it, to walk it as part of his bride that he's coming back for, the king's army and ecclesia. That's advancing towards victory, bringing God's kingdom on earth. The revival that we are in and the harvest that we've been talking about is absolutely contingent on our loving people, loving our neighbor. The word for love in this scripture, I looked it up, it is agape. It's the God kind of love. The same word that God loves us, God for, God's love for us, agape, we're to love him with, and people, everybody. John's, John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. I'm just going to look at that word in the word wealth on John 3.16. Of course, we know what John 3.16 is. For God so loved the world. John 3.16. I'm just going to look at the word wealth for loved, loved there. And I know we've read this before. Sometimes these things just come alive in a different way when, you, when your emphasis, when you're studying for a word, it's just the emphasis is a little different. Unconditional love, love, unconditional love, love by choice and by an act of the will. The word denotes unconquerable benevolence and undefeatable goodwill. Agapeo will never seek anything but the highest good for mellow, fellow mankind. Agapeo and agape are the words for God's unconditional love. It does not need a chemistry, an affirmity, or a feeling. Agapeo is a word that exclusively belongs to the Christian community. 
It is a love virtually unknown to writers outside the New Testament. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Apart from him, it's not possible to love others this way. I'm going to look at Romans 5.5. 5. And I'm going to read the word off there as well, but I'm going to read the scripture too. Romans 5, 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It's been poured into our hearts. It's there already. It's there already. He poured it out into our hearts. Hallelujah. A word to which Christianity gave new meaning. Outside of the New Testament, it rarely occurs in existing Greek manuscripts of the period. Agape denotes an undefeatable benevolence, an unconquerable goodwill, as I just read, that always seeks the highest good of the other person no matter what he does. It is the self-giving love that gives freely, freely without asking anything in return and does not consider the worth of its, of its object. Agape is more a love by choice than phylos, which is a love by chance. And it refers to the will rather than the emotion. Agape describes the unconditional love of God that he has for the world. Hallelujah. The only way that we are capable of loving our neighbor is if the other pieces are in place. We know his love. We love him. Then we can love our neighbor. Living in the knowledge of God's love for us. Loving him with all our being. And then we are free. More free. And easier love our neighbor. Which, by the way, is anyone that is in close proximity to you at any given time. That's in your house, at your home, in a church service, in your workplace, in the marketplace, in the car in front of you, at a ball game. Any person you encounter in any way on the phone, through an email, a text, family, friends, strangers, or foes, anybody, anybody. First John 4, you go there. Verse 7. <clears throat> Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time if we love one another. God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and, in, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Abiding in love. That's living in it. Living in love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And the interesting twist in the line, love your neighbor, is the addition to as yourself. Which will automatically be in place if the first two components of God's love are in place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah are alive and well in you. Having received his love and having bountiful love for him, naturally, we will love ourselves because we begin to see ourselves as God sees us. It's not some self-consumed, new-aged kind of love of self, but the kind of love that wants the fullness of God. And we love others in the same way. We want the fullness of God operating in their lives for their peace, their comfort, their joy, their prosperity. In the same way, I want that for myself. I want, I want to want that. I want to want that for other people. In the same way that you want more wisdom, more love, more healing, more growth, more love, you want that for others. 
Our desire becomes seeing others fulfill all the purposes and plans that God has intended for them, just like I desire for myself. It's an undefeatable good will toward every person, and even if they are unlovable. A life that delights in the Lord and time spent with him equals a person who had Christ's love poured out in our hearts, then pours out love with great ease to others. Those seemingly unlovable people suddenly become the people, the person I want to love on more. And that includes those who we have established relationships with, strangers, and enemies. Fridays, give him 15. I don't know if anybody here, I know some listen to the fifth, give him 15 or read it was one of those confirmation moments this week, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to read you some of it. I don't need my glasses. And this post was by Tim, uh, Dutch Sheets' daughter, Sarah Weinberg, and him. They both wrote it. And he says, Sarah chose the topic and did most of the work. Not surprisingly, she chose the subject of love. Sarah is a lover of people and dogs and cats and birds and... Jesus, of course, walked in perfect love. He, and chickens. <laughs> he demonstrated that we could speak out against evil, stand for truth, reject hypocrisy, and make other righteous stands, all while loving perfectly. Christ epitomized loving the person while rejecting the sin, even to the point of stating from the cross the most heinous, unjust, and evil act in history. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He expects us to emulate him. We all just love the verses. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In today's post, Sarah does a wonderful job of reminding us that if we are to embody, represent, and reveal Christ and heal the divisions in our land, it will be through our love. She says, when thinking about the many divisions we see, in the culture of America right now, racial, political, religious, to name a few, I ask myself these, these questions. If Jesus were right here walking among us and leading the Church of America in this time, what would he say to the people who don't know him? How would he love them? How would he speak about them when they weren't around? What would he say to heal their hurting, bitter, angry, or deceived hearts? These questions led me into a season of soul searching because what I am frequently hearing spoken by we, the church, is not what I believe Jesus would be speaking. I think perhaps the culture of division we are so surrounded by in America has crept into the culture of the church. Have we forgotten how to see people as people? A person with a different political persuasion is a person. Someone with, with different views on sexuality is a person. An individual who espouses a different religion is a person. Each of them deserves love and kindness, and I believe anything else grieves God's heart. As I said, I'm a millennial. My generation, along with Gen X, is sandwiched between the hardworking, confident baby boomers and the free-spirited, compassionate Gen Z. I endeavor to see and appreciate the perspectives of each generation and have often thought about how generational gaps can be bridged. I was pondering this as I watched my dad, Dutch Sheets, on Flashpoint last week. He spoke about a vision he had in 2000, 2001, and the vision he saw how hard it was going to be to disciple the younger generation in the coming move of God without cramming religion down their throats. How do we do this? How do we bridge this great divide? I truly believe the answer isn't as complicated as, as we often make it. It is as simple as we love them just as they are. 1 John 4, 19, the Passion Translation says, our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. It's wonderful when he simplifies things for us. Hallelujah. I was listening to Francis Chan recently, actually this past week. Sometimes when I'm studying for a message, I like to hear, you know, what other ministers have to say on the subject. It, sometimes it sparks some things in me, some thought process. And I was listening to Francis Chan. I just punched in that scripture, that you know, our opening scripture, and, and this popped up, and I just felt compelled to click on it. And his message, this message was from 2010. 
And I was surprised to hear him prophesy about something in the future, though even in the moment when he was saying, he said, I don't, I'm not saying that this is prophetic or anything, but he said this, he said that given the current state of things back in 2010 in the world and how things are going, he could feel, fully see a time that there would come when the word of God and the truth that's in God's word would be unacceptable in the public square and that it would be labeled hate speech. Are we seeing that play out today? He went on to say that the only way the church can survive and flourish in that and continue to usher and bring people into the kingdom of God is back to the basics and the foundation of the word, which is to love God and love people. Those basic principles sustain, embolden, and grow the church. Love God, love people. And the reason for that is that the world has to, what the world has to offer is a counterfeit to the love of God. And many people are tiring and will tire of the lies and the manipulation and the indoctrination of the evil one who only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He comes as an angel of light in the beginning, looks good for a second, for a moment, <coughs> but will always be exposed. That's why we can prophesy that the fields are white unto harvest. People are and will continue to search for truth, judge justice, and goodness and love, real love, agape all love. That's what they hunger and thirst for. As I was thinking about loving others in today's climate, I started to meditate on the agape, unconditional love, that desire to see people saved and fulfill the plans and purposes that I just talked about, and to, to walk in that fullness of all that they are and have and will, and a disdain, that that's where that disdain comes for seeing them deceived. Because I have that unconditional love for them. I want to see people, everybody, not deceived by the enemy. And that's why it motivates us to stand for the truth and for righteousness and for the truth of God's word, which is love. Love is why we continue to combat the lies of the enemy in today's culture with God's truth. And they're saying it's hate speech, but it's the opposite of that. It's love. It's love. And it is the exact opposite of hate speech. Hallelujah. We want to see people know the truth, God's truth, because we love them. That's the ultimate love. It goes back to that line I read in the content section of the Deuteronomy, uh, book of Deuteronomy, and why Moses was so emphatic that the children of Israel keep the commandment, the covenant commandment with God, is that obedience to God is equated with life, blessing, health, and prosperity. All things that we want for ourselves, and therefore what we want for all people, for those who are suffering, hurting, dying, and ignorant, even when they hate us, we abound in love, and it's why we stand for righteousness. For love's sake, we stand for righteousness. Love God and love people, and it's entirely possible. It wouldn't be if it wasn't in Scripture. It wouldn't be a commandment if it wasn't possible. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all. Let's make that a personal prayer. May you, Lord, make me increase and abound in love to everyone. Hallelujah. Make me increase. Make me abound in love to everyone. And I'm going to end with this very familiar but beautiful scripture entitled The Greatest Gift. And I'm going to read the Passion Translation, but it's 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. We all have heard it. I like the Passion Translation. If I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that could move mountains, but have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. 
Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when a blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter where it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It is more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial, but when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. When I was a child, I spoke about childish matters, for I saw things like a child and reasoned like a child. But the day came when I matured and I set aside my childish ways. For now we see but a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries as though reflected in a mirror. But one day we will see face to face. My understanding is incomplete now, but one day I will understand everything just as everything about me has been fully understood. Until then, there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, yet love surpasses them all. So above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which we run. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you and praise you, Lord. Seal it to us, Lord. Help all of us, each one of us, every one of us, desire to love you more, to love people more, to receive your love, to always have you on our mind. I thank you and praise you, Lord, that you are helping us, each one, teaching us how to do it perfectly. How to agape, I'll love you. How to agape, I'll love each other. And strangers, and any person that we meet, <clears throat> any enemies, anyone who speaks uh, bad about us, Lord. Anybody. Help Thank us you. to love them. With that agape, I'll kind of love. Yeah. I thank you and praise you, Lord, that you're with us as we go our way today. We will keep you on our mind. You are always on our mind. Hallelujah. We glorify, we praise your name. You are an awesome God. You are a good God. You are a loving Father. And we thank you, Lord. We're so grateful for that. Thank you, Lord, for your protection upon us as we go our ways today. In Jesus' name, amen.